This is Rain Hamcast number 53, posted October 30th, 2021 on the rainreport.com and on the YouTube Rain Report channel. See the link on the rainreport.com's main menu. I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. We're digging into RF grounding, something every ham needs to take seriously, especially if you're in an area prone to frequent lightning strikes. Rain's Hap Holly, KC9RP, recently spoke with Jim Hull, W9JGH, who has battled local and atmospheric noise for years in his suburban Chicago home until he got his ground system right. Jim, W9JGH, was first licensed as a ham in 2011, then got his extra in 2012. Today he is a project manager by profession and president of CSRA, the Chicago Suburban Radio Association. Here is our second and final excerpt from Haps and Jim's recent conversation, delving into the nuts and bolts of RF grounding. Jim, what makes a good ground? Hap, there are two different types of grounds that we're really talking about, and I don't think we've been real clear about that, but there is an RF ground and there is a lightning ground. When it comes to your antenna, You want to make sure that you have a lightning ground on the antenna, which will help protect it in case of a lightning strike. And as far as an RF ground goes, which is the one that I've been chasing quite a bit, it is intended to eliminate noise, eliminates RF coming back into the shack. The RF ground is the one where all of your equipment goes to a single point ground. A lightning ground is the shortest path from your antenna mount to a ground rod. Which is more important, to ground the station or to ground the antenna system? The antenna system needs to be grounded for lightning protection. And the ham station or the entire system needs to be protected for RF coming back in the shack or noise coming into the shack. I have both combined. So I have the ground rod out behind my house, connected to the bus bar, which connects all of the grounds in the station. And I have ground rods at each one of my antennas, one on the garage, two of them on the house, and one on the fence alongside things. So I have the lightning grounds there, and I have the RF grounds just as it comes into the house. We need to backtrack a little bit to define what a bus bar is. And why is it important? The bus bar is a common point for all of your equipment to be grounded to. The idea is you want to make sure everything in the shack has one path to ground, and it's all the same path. You wouldn't want to have your radio grounded in one location and your, say, amplifier grounded in a different location. The bus bar makes that possible. Many people have used a simple copper pipe, hammered it flat, drilled holes in it, and voila, you have a bus bar. In my case, I purchased them on Amazon for, I believe, about $30 a piece, and I have them mounted just outside the shack and just outside the house. Let's be clear here that what you don't want to do is to have one braid, let's say, go from your radio to an amplifier to a switch and then have one braid take all three of those to a bus bar. That is absolutely correct. Each piece of equipment needs to have its own ground wire going to the bus bar. If you have your radio, then it goes over to your amplifier and then say to your tuner, what you've created is several different ground loops. The amplifier can find ground by going back to the radio and then back out and going down to the tuner in the case I just described. You don't want to create any possible ground loops. That's why you have everything going to a common point ground. That's one of the most important facts when it comes to at least the RF grounding. 
You mentioned each braid in a round type system, in the shack part of it anyway, has to be the same length. It can be difficult to do, especially if your shack is laid out kind of in a linear fashion where you have things on the right side of the table and things on the far left side of the table. The idea that everything needs to be the same length comes from my former employment working in extremely high voltages, that you want to make sure that everything has the same length to the ground rod. In case there is some sort of lightning strike, every piece of wire, as small as it is, has a bit of resistance. And that resistance is higher on longer wires. So if everything in your shack is the same length ground wire, if the lightning strikes, everything in your shack would become charged at the same rate. And that's what helps prevent damage. When different pieces of equipment become charged at different rates, there is a voltage difference between the two, and that can cause the damage. So it is my recommendation that everything be the same length wire going to the bus bar. I don't believe I've heard much of anyone else say that that should be done, but that is my belief. But if you have a lightning strike, it really doesn't matter, does it? A direct lightning strike can be millions and millions of volts. No matter how good your protection is, it is quite likely that you are going to take damage from a direct lightning strike. I've never heard of anybody who has had a direct strike and been able to survive. However, a near lightning strike in the neighbor's yard or in the neighbor's house or something like that, that can cause a huge electromagnetic pulse. And that you can be protected from by having the correct grounding scheme. What's more important, grounding the station with a ground rod and related hardware or grounding your antenna system? They're equally important. However, they serve two different functions. Grounding your antenna system is providing the shortest path to ground from the antenna. That's where you want to have the shortest wire goes right to the ground rod. That is lightning protection. If lightning hits, it's going to look for the shortest path that it can find to ground. Now, it won't all follow that path. There will be a charge that follows the rest of your wiring. However, if that ground is good enough, and if it is a short enough path, the majority of all of the energy will be dissipated into the ground. And that can protect your station from having damage like fire type damage, like where a radio would literally catch fire because there is so much voltage there. It would probably cause damage to the radio, but at least your house wouldn't burn down. When we talk about grounding your station, that is done more to eliminate noise and interference from all of these little wall warts that we all have to charge our cell phones and smartwatches and things like that. That grounding scheme, when you ground your station to a single point and then take that out to the ground rod, that protects you or helps you prevent noise. And that has been my motivation from the very beginning. If you have a tower and radios, how effective is that kind of a system for grounding the antenna? It can be used as a ground, although it is not extremely effective because it is sitting on top of the ground. And if the ground itself is dry, then you have very poor conducting between the radial or counterpoise and the ground. So you have a high resistance. And if you do take a lightning strike or if there is a large energy pulse, it won't be able to dissipate into the ground as well as it could with an eight-foot ground rod. This is Rain Hamcast number 53, posted October 30th, 2021. Hap Holly KC9RP will conclude his Zoom discussion with Jim Hull, W9JGH, about RF grounding after you identify your station.
I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. We'll be right back. You mentioned that there is noise involved in grounding. What type of antenna is less susceptible or more susceptible to noise? I have found in my personal setup, my QTH, that my horizontal hex beam picks up more noise than my vertical. And I know that's not the common belief. But in my situation, that is the way it works. I get more noise on the horizontal antennas than I do on the verticals. My guess is that's because I have overhead power lines around my house. And I think that the horizontal tends to couple with the power lines better than the vertical does. But as far as which works best... It really is going to kind of depend on your situation and the terrain around you. You have eliminated most of the noise sources from your station because of what you have done with grounding, but that you still have a big noise source that happens to be north of your property. That is correct. When I turn my hex beam to the north, my noise level goes up exponentially. And if I turn it to the south, it goes down exponentially, which leads me to believe that my noise source is to the north of me. The noise source comes and goes, and I have yet to figure out if there's a pattern, a certain time of the day, a certain day of the week. But when it turns on, it is such a high, incredible electrical noise a buzzing, if you will, that my station is virtually useless at that point. I have eliminated one by one all of the noise sources that I can in the house by chasing them down and replacing them or determining that they were not a high enough source of noise to cause a problem. Now, the combination of all of the different things in the house was eliminated by doing a good ground on there. So at this point, my noise level is quite low unless that noise source to the north is on. I just purchased a spectrum analyzer in the hopes of determining what that noise source is. Still chasing that one down. Even if you determine that the noise source plaguing you is that pinball arcade. How do you deal with that kind of a noise source from a human level? That is a very good question. And that is a problem that I don't have just yet. But if it comes to that, first thing I would do is talk to the owner of the arcade. He's a very reasonable guy. I've talked to him on several other occasions about different things. And I would explain to him that this is the problem I'm having. And we would try and work together to find a solution. To be absolutely honest with you, I don't know if there is a solution to eliminating as many pinball machines as he has on the electric system for picking up the noise. So I may try to find some way of filtering it on my end. But to be honest, I'm not sure how I'm going to fix it when I find out what it is. Can you have an effective ground system without lightning arresters? In my opinion, no, you cannot have an effective lightning protection ground system without lightning arresters. As we stated earlier, there's the RF grounding and there's the lightning protection grounding. The RF grounding would not need a lightning arrestor in the line because you're just bringing everything in the station to a single point ground. However, if you were to get a direct lightning strike or a nearby lightning strike, the lightning arrestor in your line discharges the energy to ground, where if you did not have one, all of that energy would discharge to ground through your equipment. So, For lightning ground, yes, you have to absolutely have 
lightning arresters, and they need to be outside of the house. You want to make sure you get rid of the lightning before it comes into the house. Where would you recommend my listeners go to read more and learn more about RF grounding? The first place I would say to go to is the ARRL. They have a book that they published recently called Grounding and Bonding for the Radio Amateur. It's a very good book, a lot of good information there. The internet is a great source to find a lot of different information. And as a matter of fact, my first foray into grounding, when I first started studying and trying to learn what was going on, I went to a website called Ask Dave Kassler, K-E-0-O-G, and his episode number eight was extremely helpful in learning the basics of grounding and bonding and why you need to do things like that. He has a regular ham cast, and I understand now he is a writer for QST, Dave Kassler, K-E-0-O-G. Bonding and grounding are the same thing. What you want to do and what you really need to do and to help eliminate electrical noise is bond your grounding system to your electrical system outside where your power comes in by the meter. Your power service put in a ground rod. You need to connect your station ground to that ground rod. Usually use a number six stranded wire, connect them together. Otherwise, your electrical system in the house can be at one ground potential when your radios can be at another ground potential. And that is a terrific source of noise. But how far apart can your station ground, eight foot copper clad steel rod be from the comet rod and still be effective? There is a very big debate that how far apart ground rods can be. The common theme that I have heard is you want to have ground rods not too much more than 10 feet apart. So if your station ground is perhaps 20 feet away from your ComEd ground, it would be highly recommended to add a ground rod in between the two. More ground rods are better than trying to run long lengths of wire. In essence, I don't think there is a honest answer that it has to be X number of feet. You could put a ground rod every six inches if you wanted to, but I think the common belief is not too much more than 10 feet. Mine is actually about 12 from the ground rod to the comment. If someone wants to contact you, how do they? You can email me at w9jgh at arrl.net. Whiskey 9 Juliet Golf Hotel at arrl.net. And that concludes a riveting conversation about the nuts and bolts of RF grounding between Hap Holly, KC9RP, and Jim Hall, W9JGH, a suburban resident of Chicago and an extra-class licensee since 2012. Today, Jim is a project manager by profession, and he's president of CSRA, the Chicago Suburban Radio Association. If you missed the first excerpt from Hap and Jim's RF grounding conversation, it's available as Rain Hamcast number 52 on the rainreport.com, as is the excerpt you just heard. Rain Hamcast number 54 will update November 13th, 2021. The Rain Hamcast is produced by Rain's founder and producer, Hap Polly, KC9RP. It is copyright 1985, 2021, Rain. All rights are reserved. RAIN programming is made available under a Creative Commons license. You are authorized to download, share, post, and transmit this bi-weekly hamcast via amateur radio in its entirety. Your feedback and support for this hamcast are welcome on the RAINReport.com. YouTube Technical Assistance, Tom Shimizu, N9JDI. I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. 
Keep on hamming.